All right. So uh, the one thing that I thought was interesting about what Chris said was being a category of one. You know, Scott mentioned about a, a bloodbath of uh, the investor market in single family and multifamily, but Chris has found a way to be a category of one, to do something that no one else is doing. Someone else who I, I, I see from my perspective that's doing that as well is the Self Storage Academy, Scott Myers. So come up on stage and let's talk about some financing and how you, how you get these uh, self storages off the ground. Thanks, Scott. All right, good morning, everyone. Let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. Nice, much better. There's more caffeine in the back if you, uh, if you need it. And uh, once again, let's start with a round of applause for Ben and Joe for putting on this fantastic event. And now, so as, as you've seen from the speakers and the folks that come up on stage here, you know, Joe has surrounded himself with folks that care about the business and care about teaching others and have a heart and a passion for that. So listen, folks, you're, you're going to learn some of the nuts and bolts. You can learn that other places. You can go back and, and get involved and get immersed in the industry, whatever that asset class is that you choose. But listen, listen to what Chris has to say. This is a guy that's been through economic cycles, and he's doing a number of transactions, as well as everybody else up here. And by the way, let's give Chris another round of applause. But let, let's listen to the basic business stuff. I know it, it's real easy to sit here and do emails and do everything else until we get to the meat, but this is the meat of the business. We're talking about sustainable businesses that we're trying to build, creating an empire that is going to last. So take this information down and remember it. All right, so with that, uh, what we're going to be talking about is creative financing. Is that correct? Yeah? Yes or yes? Okay. So I'm going to bring up my panel now. We have uh, Kevin Amos, who's been investing in real estate for the last 15 years. He has uh, hundreds of creatively financed deals under his belt, including lease options, subject to. Um, he's got owner-financed uh, deals he's done. He's the founder and president of Pine Financial, a leader in the hard money lending space. He's raised over $55 million in private equity to fund his deals and for his clients. He's also the author of The 45-Day Investor, which hit number one on Amazon. He's a frequent speaker and has been quoted in the Las Vegas Review Journal, the Denver Post, Yahoo Real Estate, and several other publications and blogs. So let's welcome Mr. Kevin Amos. We also have Steve Bighouse, who has 29 years experience in the mortgage industry, and after leaving banking in 2001, Steve has been devoting his time to financing real estate investors nationwide. He's built a team of seasoned professionals to support his business model and provides a resource to both entry-level and seasoned investors. He's spoken at many events like this to share his knowledge of investment property financing, and he's received numerous rewards for his events over the years, so let's welcome Mr. Steve Bighouse. Last but certainly not least, Calvin Newton. He has experience in development, financing, and syndication of over $150 million in real estate private placements with, New York's, with the New York Stock Exchange firm Bear Stearns. Some of you may have heard of that. And the private equity firm, help me pronounce this again. I know you told me. Leb Kutcher, is that it? Leb Kutcher. Leb Kutcher. Leb Kutcher, Inc., uh, where he led the effort in uh, renovating mobile home parks in the southwest Florida and Colorado. He also developed 320 condominiums in Sarasota County, Florida and 467 multifamily units in the Dallas Metroplex. So let's uh, welcome Calvin. Cool. All right. Uh, my name is Scott Myers. Uh, if you didn't uh, hear the panel discussion, my intro yesterday, uh, I'm in the self-storage space. Prior to that, I did uh, 80 single-family houses. We did over 400 apartment units, got into self-storage, and uh, sold all the rest, got rid of all my tenants and toilets, and uh, never looked back. So we, uh, we financed uh, tens of millions of dollars in syndicates and PPMs for our deals. We partner with our students. I also have an information business as well where we teach people how to do this so that when they go out and they find uh, too many deals or a, a too big of a deal, then they come to us and we raise the capital and partner on those as well. Uh, but I define myself as a husband, a father of three. I'm a big racing fan. And uh, we take two months out of the year, my family and I, and we go off the grid. We take our students and our staff, whoever wants to go, and we build houses in the Dominican Republic and Mexico. And that's what self-storage has done for us. So with that, we're going to be talking about, and by the way, you know, thank you. Um, I don't know who, if it's Ben or uh, Joe, who's responsible for this. You, you titled this creative financing, and then you put me, put me with three bankers up here who get fired for doing creative financing. So uh, I appreciate that. You have a lot of faith in me. I appreciate that. So, all right. So I've, I've prepared a few questions for these guys, unsuspecting, and we're going to see how they answer them because uh, we're going to put them to the test here. Creative financing with three, three bankers. Well, let's start out with, um, I guess not, the first wait, thing. We gotta, um, we're not a banker here. Yeah? I'm okay. not a banker. Uh, I am. He is. Okay. So we have one banker and other lenders. <laughs> one, Got it. Admit, one will admit it. Thank you for the distinction. 
So let's, let's start. We'll get down with each one of you, just right on down the line. How do you do no money down today when you're including financing, traditional debt financing? Oh, that's a, kind of a broad question, right? And I got started when I was real young. I was 21 years old, bought my first house. And look, when you're 21, going to college full-time, working part-time, no cash, no credit, no nothing, and you still want to get into this business, you got to find really creative ways to be successful. And I got going with lease options, and my first transaction was a lease options transaction, no money down. Um, so I think the owner financing is really the easiest way to get into no money down transactions. With that said, hard money is also a fantastic mm -hmm. way. There's a lot of hard money lenders across the country that will finance based on the after repaired value. And so if you get a low enough price, you could buy it and repair it and have the loan cover all of, all of that. Get it, get it fixed up, rehabbed, get a tenant in place, and then you could refinance with a banker. Mm -hmm and get your permanent loan and, and never have any money into it. So those are a couple, couple easy ways to get going with no money. Mm -hmm. okay. Steve, what would you say for today? You know, I would, I would agree with the gentleman here in that, that, that I see in various markets now where people are able to get in and utilize the private money or the owner financing to get them in, get the property rehab, and then come to me. Uh, Fannie and Freddie both in that, they, you know, there's no season requirement on a rate and term. And so you can get out of, you can get out of it relatively easy. Uh, it works well. You know, it's not every market, but you've got to buy the right property. You've got to buy something where there's, there's some value there when you walk into it. Mm -hmm. Calvin. I'm a nationwide commercial lender, and I do HUD loans, and I haven't seen a nothing down HUD loan because we want you to have some money in the game, skin in the game. Mm -hmm. Now, we have had some stuff given to us for nothing down over the years, but that was big stuff from banks. It wasn't single-family homes. Okay, perfect, perfect. Well, one, one of the things that we did uh, discuss uh, prior to this is uh, there's a lot of folks that are trying to uh, bridge the gap. I shouldn't say try to, that are getting ready to bridge the gap going from single family into commercial. And so how do we do that? More commas, more zeros, it may seem a little scary. Um, you know, have I slugged it out long enough in the single family realm or what I'm doing? You know, have I earned the right to get into commercial? So let's talk about how we get into and make that leap up the ladder into commercial. And if we don't have the cash, how do we do that creatively? I think that might be the best question for Calvin. I'm not in the commercial mm -hmm. space, so I haven't actually made that leap yet. So maybe I'll so defer. So that would be a creative answer, so we'll just defer to Calvin. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, our last speaker there was talking about cheaper is not always better. Mm -hmm. The hardest loan you'll ever get is that 500000 to a $1 million loan. Because my loan started a million, goes from a million to one million to five million for multifamily. Mm -hmm. I'm not a banker. I'm not a a mortgage broker. I'm a correspondent, and I only deal in commercial, which has to be five units or more, okay? And new people coming from the housing market, single-family home market, they want to buy in that $500 to $1 million range because that's their comfort zone. And I see, I mean, some of them's got multi-million dollar net worth, but they still want to do that because they're going into commercial. Mm -hmm. And I... I can't help them. Their local banker might be able to help them. Uh, credit union probably is a good place for them to go take a look. Uh, so what I see is I tell them, you know, you go buy a property for a million and a quarter, the mortgage is going to come in about a million, then I can work with them and we can get them that mortgage. You know, uh, that's on apartments. So, you know, assisted living, that's a whole nother ball game. You can do a single family home conversion in assisted living for around a million dollars, and that would be considered commercial as well. Mm -hmm. uh, that's about what I can say. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Steve. Well, you know, in my world, and, and, and what I do in that is I recognize what I'm good at. I'm good at the one to four family conventional lending working within Fannie and Freddie guidelines. That's, what, that's the battle I pick. I do probably 500 plus loans a year. I'm looking to expand that. I work across the nation. That's my battle. My thing is, is when people ask me about commercial, I resource, and that's what I do. So I can get people, you know, like Calvin, or other people that can help them make that, you know, make that jump. I had a gentleman in Seattle, helped him out with a single family. He decided he wanted to move into apartment buildings. He did a 1031 exchange. It was great. He worked with the local bank. You know, I was able to refer that over. 
But, you know, I get some people that, that want it, you know, that's the natural evolution. People want to move into the bigger things. You know, I can set them up the platform with the single family, they can make that move. How they do it, not my world. And I, and I recognize that. So, speaking for myself, wanting to get out of um, houses and uh, achieve the economies of scale that comes with uh, having apartments and having a property manager or property management company running the facility, uh, the biggest question was, you know, what's your experience? And so that's what the lenders wanted to know. You know, show me that you have some experience. And uh, I said, well, I, I really don't, other than, you know what? I view running apartments as a little bit easier than what I've been doing. I cut my teeth here, and, and you know what? I could probably do the apartments and overseeing a manager with one hand tied behind my back. No, I didn't say that to the lenders, but <laughs> let them know that, hey, this is a little tougher gig that I've been doing over the past several years. Um, so the stipulation was everything looked good, went through the underwriting, um, but it, it, was, it was still that experience piece. And so they said that I had to have a management company in place for a year, a third-party property management company, professionally uh, managed facility, and then they would uh, finance it. So I agreed and signed on, uh, only to find that about six months down the road, the, the uh, apartment complex's occupancy and NOI started to decline. And I said, all right, I'm going to hand the keys back to you unless you hand this over to me and let me run it. And I did, and we ramped it up. And so uh, just be prepared for them to ask for the experience. If it's not a management company, then bring in somebody that can be part of your LLC. They don't have to necessarily sign on the note, but bring them into your LLC so that they have experience. Many times that'll tick the box for the lender. Uh, now, specifically with regards to the creative financing piece, as, as we're touching on here, the you know, more commas and zeros, where do you find that extra money? And um, you know, we've already kind of touched on that a little bit. It's, it's going back to the seller. Will you hold some of this back? Getting some mezzanine financing, um, putting together some private money, doing some hard money to, to bridge that gap between the down payment. But the one encouragement that I would give to all of you is that if you find a good deal, the money will come. Just, be, just don't make sure that you don't overpay for that money, for that down payment, so that you're over leveraged, that the numbers work. But if you find a good deal, the money will come, so don't be scared. You can always bring somebody else into that deal, and if it still doesn't make sense at that point, then you can wholesale it off to somebody else. But you've earned the right to go out there and, and look for those bigger deals, so go, go do it. All right, next is, um, you know, how do you turn pro? And this is, a, we'll, we'll start with you, Steve. You know, how do you go from you know, 25 finance single-family properties to go then up to 50 to 75 to 100 per year? You know, what, there's, there's thresholds for certain lenders, and you know, when you begin to do the underwriting, so you know, what is the threshold? And maybe it's not 50 that I mentioned here, but what do you do to take it to that next level? So uh, Fannie's always been probably a little bit more investor-friendly than Freddie Mac. Uh, now Freddie Mac started making mm -hmm. some change, changes the uh, first part of last year, trying to reach out into that arena. They still don't get it. Fannie's always been pretty good with the investors. Now, Fannie's limit is 10 finance properties per borrower. And uh, what I find in my world is that a lot of people don't recognize, you know, domestic partners, husband and wife, they can actually double that if they can qualify. Once they get to that point, you know, let's say theoretically there are, you know, 18, 20 houses between the two of them, how do they go from there? Well, that's where, again, with my, you know, with the network that I've created, being able to take them where they can actually maintain those properties and then move into another world and that if they want to go above that. So I've got some, you know, I've got people that own 60 plus houses that, you know, they've made that world. But the biggest transition is going from residential to commercial. You've got to change that mindset because the world's different. You know, lending's different out there. Rates aren't as good. So they get set up in that, that single family that, oh, great, we're getting, you know, mid to, mid to high fours. Well, then they move into the commercial world and it's different. Maybe there's a, you know, maybe it's a seven-year balloon, a 10-year balloon. They get a little disappointed. But again, if you're a small business owner, guess what type of finance you're going to get? You're going to get the same type of finance. And that's really their biggest obstacle is changing that mindset to make that move. Calvin, how would you answer that? I'm not in the housing market. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so looking back to, I can on your career. I to apartments, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and that's what we're talking about, you know, the, the going for the four or five or six or ten. Mm -hmm. But when we hit the million dollar deal, then I'm in the game and we would start with Fannie. Uh, my HUD lending starts at four million on apartments and uh, the assisted living starts at five and a half million and goes up from there. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't think a beginner would be jumping on a four million dollar property, but the million dollar property is like the houses we were talking about a while ago in the Midwest. You know, you can buy them for $20,000. I've got clients right now who are cashing out 
of houses they bought in Denver in 2008 for 150,000. They're coming to us and we're wrapping that into a mortgage because now they will appraise for 450 and they're taking that and going out and buying apartment mm -hmm. units. All right, Kevin, how would you yeah, tackle that going, talk about going this one for a while? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's pretty common in the single house, single family house business to use Fannie and Freddie to the max because that's the cheapest money you can get. Mm -hmm. So I would max out Fannie and Freddie first, and then you gotta graduate, we gotta grow up, and we don't go to banks anymore. It's all gonna be private money, it's all gonna be owner financing, and then there is no limit. I've never been asked for my credit report, I've never been asked for, frankly, down payments, none of that when I'm going out and working directly with private money or with owner carry financing. Um, so it's not gonna be the same terms though, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think a good way to get Good way to get a lot of properties might be credit partners. I'm not saying maybe not for everybody, okay? But you can go out and get partners where they'll get the loans for you on Fannie and Freddie and you can keep getting this cheap money and then partner with them and you each take half the profit or whatever your, your split is, you manage it. So that's one way to do it. I, lo I love the lease options, I love the subject twos because I can, I can just keep going forever. Um, and then you didn't touch on this, Steve, but when you start using different entities and corporations, you could start getting money into like C corporations, for example, and this is a higher level here. But if a C corporation files its own tax return and nothing flows to a personal tax return. So you could have properties in that kind of a, an entity and it won't show up on your personal returns or anything and you can get those loans off of your, uh, off of your credit, off of your what am I trying to say? Steve might want to help me out here, but when you're going to go get more loans, you can just start the whole process over again. Yeah. So I've, I've had clients that have done like the people that, that own 60 houses. They own them in Indianapolis. So basically what they did is they moved their entire real estate pro portfolio over to an S-Corp. And that's, that's the way they did it. Uh, C-Corp. But S-Corp still flows to the person. Well, I understood. Return. But either way it goes and that the income comes there. But the idea in that is to get them off of your personal credit and moving them over. And that's what they did. So I, you know, we're, we're working on round three with them because they want to get to 70 properties. That's the way they're going to get there. Whether it's an S corp or a C corp, you know, and that's that's a conversation you want to have with your accountant as far as figuring out the best business entity to utilize. But the idea is to get them off so you can continue that over again. And if you want, just want more doors and maybe yeah. go to the multifamily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, good. So in terms of, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about syndication and a lot about private equity, and uh, there's uh, differing times as when we go to private equity versus taking things to a lender. So in, in your opinion, um, what type of a deal do you either know personally in, in what you're investing in that you know you're going to go to get traditional financing for versus private equity? Or for those of you that see those come back, do you immediately say, yeah, this is something that we're probably not going to lend on, but you should go seek private equity. So what, what is the, 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 the delineation between what goes to traditional lending and what goes to nothing but private equity? I'll start with you, Calvin. Uh, traditional lending for me is apartments or assisted living facilities. Uh, we can do the rehab, we can do new construction money for all of that. So for sending out to private let, lenders. Let me, can I interrupt? Let me stop you there. So I guess what I'm getting at is, okay, so you've got an assisted living, you've got an apartment that comes in and you, know, you look at this and you say, mm -mm, we're not gonna do it, it's a good deal, but there's something off in the ratios, there's something that we don't like that we know is not gonna go through underwriting. When, does that, when do you then advise them to say, hey, listen, you still got a deal here, but we can't fund it, you need to go and get private equity. What, what does that look like? At what point do you say, I can't help you, but you should go here? And that's where I would suggest someone trying to do a lease option on it. Mm -hmm. And they go out and get some private funds for it. They need to clean it up maybe for a couple of years before we can finance it. Clean um, it up. Define cleaning up. Cleaning up is mismanagement, poor management. It's in bad shape. Uh, maybe you need some rehab done to it. Uh, with us, if it's a has had major construction on it, it has to go for two years before we can lend against it. Okay. We have to go under the Bacon Davis uh, rule for mm -hmm. the wages on it. Uh, and the idea is that somebody's bringing in cheap labor and they're not doing a good job, it's gonna fall apart in two years. If it hasn't fallen apart, then we'll be glad to finance it for you. And there are a lot of assisted living and apartment complexes that fall in that category that they need to be cleaned up. We, we like to see the seller carry back on something like that because the seller's interest. got a vested interest mm -hmm. in it there. Okay. 
So um, you like basically what you're saying. You like the squeak clean stuff that you can get it through underwriting and you get paid, right? Is I love vanilla. Just kidding, Kevin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we can talk about HUD all day long, but if so, it's so vanilla, we can get it closed. So cleaned up, meaning um, you know, there's some construction or maybe some uh, liability hanging out there. Perhaps you know, the debt service coverage ratios don't work um, in exactly. those terms. Um, mm -hmm. And then to be creative, you know, let's say they're bringing in a down payment from private equity, some seller financing. You know, are there any thresholds at that point that you still say no, or you know what, you're going to have to go all private equity? Uh, you know, we're looking for, for the credit partner mm -hmm. in that case to go out and get credit partners to sign off. And what we're looking for at that point, does that credit partner have liquid assets or something he can turn mm -hmm. into liquid assets to make the uh, mortgage payment if something goes bad mm -hmm. and they're not getting enough NOI to make their payments on. Okay. So. Steve, what do you think? Is, and is the question clear? It's a good deal, but there's some, for some reason, there's just something that you don't like from a lending standpoint that you're going to tell them to go to private equity. You what know, what is that? A lot of times my clients, when they come to me, and you know, basically Fannie and Freddie both have rules, um, you know, as far as the qualifications. Sometimes they don't fit in there. Now, how many people here like paying income tax? Good point. Yeah, <laughs> one, one, okay. So I don't either. But a lot of times people, I'd say probably half of my database is self-employed. The whole goal is not to pay any. But what happens is it's a double-edged sword. You, know, you don't pay any taxes, but you can't qualify for a loan. Mm -hmm. So something, somebody like myself, when I see that, they've got a great property, they want to do it, that's where private equity comes in. So my job and that's basically to recognize that, say, you might not fit in this box that I have, but I know somebody that will, and that's what they've got to do. You know, there's no problem, but they, they've got credit, they've got assets, you know, they've got everything that they need, but they just aren't able to qualify for traditional loans. So that's where private equity really comes in handy. And, that, and having somebody that could do it. There's a lot of people out there that say they can do it, whether or not they perform is one thing. That's for sure. Kevin, how would you tackle that? Well, I think each deal has so many different variables, so each one you could take a different direction. And I think the financing on any deal is really the driver. So when you meet with somebody, meet with a seller, and you're talking to them and trying to structure a deal, how you're going to financing it has everything to do with how you negotiate that deal. Mm -hmm. So let's say if we're in the pretty home business, like the lease options and subject twos, I think you should do those as much as possible. And in fact, it's gonna get more popular as interest rates go up because people are locking in low rates now and that makes the deals even more attractive because you're, you can get a lower, lower rate. Um, but I, on the hard money lending side, we're really in the nasty home business, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yep. the nastier the better. And the word in lending that we use is habitability. If it's not habitable, these guys can't finance it. Mm -hmm. I can. So what, you, what we see a lot is people look for the foundation problems and the, I hate to say it, but I'm going to, meth problems, mold, asbestos, all of this stuff that can be cleaned up, and then we can qualify for the, for the conventional money. Mm -hmm. I think we found in, uh, in what we teach our folks is that uh, it, it wasn't until I really discovered the power in raising private capital for deals that I, I realized I missed out on a lot of deals because I was relying upon my lenders for so much. And then we can only grow to the degree that we have cash to put in as a, as a down payment, 20, 25% get traditional lending. Mm -hmm. um, but then I was in a position where I was uh, forced to go out and find private lending and, and get really good at it if I was going to grow the business. And then I realized that, uh, you know what? Hmm. I can get private equity investors in on these deals that have a 0% cap rate or a 1% or 2% or debt service coverage ratios. They're ugly. They've got issues with the basements. Mm -hmm. And as long as I disclose that to all, the, all my private equity investors and say, this thing ain't going to cash flow for 18 months either. You know, he can't go back to the bank and say, hey, Calvin, you, know, you all right with me not paying you for 18 months? <laughs> Take a not leap, a right? <laughs> yeah. So when you learn how, how to well, put we, these... we got something else for that. You got something else for that? Not now, this now he comes back to me. So, you know... When you get really good at, at, at the private equity, when I realized this, that um, you know, all these things that didn't fit in the traditional lending box, if I could pay cash for these things and raise private equity, I quickly went back you know, through my trash can, pulling out all the deals that I threw away because it didn't fit the box of a traditional lender. So you know, yes, once again, this is a, a big focus at this event, and, and I'll just go ahead and toot that horn even louder. Get really good at raising private equity because it allows you to do more mm -hmm. deals and we swing for the fences. And, and, and in many cases, even though they have a lot of upside, uh, the bankers just won't do it. But you and your investors can make more money on many of those deals. Not all of them, but many of them. Value add.
Mm -hmm. Value if you, add. If you can add value to the deal, that's add. how you make money. Mm -hmm. L let me just make a comment on that. You find that apartment building out there that you, is vacant, and you can get private equity, get that thing up there, get it operating, you put a HUD loan on there, you will never have any other type of loan. It's a great loan, but it's the hardest loan you'll ever get as well. But the, the, the terms and the difference compared to a regular conventional loan uh, is phenomenal. Can I give those terms? You just did. No. A, a HUD loan on apartments is 80 to 83 uh, percent loan to cost. It's a fixed rate 35 to 40 year loan, non recourse, and it's assumable. So you can sell it. So because it's assumable, that increases your uh, value on that property about 15 percent. Your NOI just went up about 36 percent. So why would you ever sell it? Why would you want to? But find that old vacant building or the one you want to really clean out and do a major rehab on it. I can finance the rehab, and yes, you don't pay me until it starts uh, producing and we get a, a CO on it. So okay. that all accumulates. We got, we got him on camera just saying that. Yeah. So good. <laughs> <laughs> and Calvin said. <laughs> Okay, so gentlemen, get your crystal balls out. <clears throat> when does the next recession occur, and what should everybody be doing to prepare for it? You want, you <laughs> Nobody wants to, to take it first. That. Okay, I'll just point it to you. Go ahead, Kevin. I'm not going to touch that, honestly. <laughs> I think, I mean, we don't, I don't know if anybody's going to answer the question, frankly, but I can tell you to prepare for it, um, I think you need to focus on not speculation, focus on cash flow. I mentioned it yesterday that. Cash is king. If you, if you have, as long as you have cash flow, you're in business. Mm -hmm. You can make money and not have cash flow and go out of business. So I like to focus on buying properties that is going to produce cash flow even when everything goes to hell. Yep. And if you do that, you're going to be okay. Now, I'm not saying I have all of my portfolio in that too. I do have some speculation deals mm -hmm. that I'm working on also. Um, but to prepare for it, that would be what I would do is, is focus on the cash flow. So to give us an example then of the safeguards within those and how do you make sure that that happens? And, and only because my mind goes immediately to some loans that may come due that you have to refinance notes to that you may not get good terms on. So, you know, what are some of the nuts and bolts of how you prepare for that in your portfolio? Buy right. I mean, you could always, if you have equity, you could always liquidate. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I love about the single family business. You, you understand that the single family homes are the most liquid real estate there is. Mm -hmm. You get into commercial and self storage and on this, there's a much smaller pool of buyers. So I, I think the single family home business is probably the safest that there is. Fair enough. Steve? Well, you know, in Mon my world. Month and day that it, the recession hits first and then. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, you know, that, that, again, that's the, uh, nobody's got a crystal ball as far as that one. But in my world, and especially back in, you know, I'm sure that there are a lot of people familiar with what happened back in the you know, early 2000s, the lead up to the crash. Um, you know, it was huge. A lot of people just did not understand the impact that that had. I mean, it was, a, you know, I mean, it could it had affected the world, and it could have went even farther if it wouldn't have done. Now, in my world, the way you look at it is you follow servicing trends, and I could see when you saw the models that the big lenders set up, you could see the servicing trends that were going because a lot of the financing was short-term financing for these people buying their primaries, and that you could see it. Once they got to the real payment, they couldn't afford it; they walked away. And all you had to do was, in my side, it was just watch the delinquencies continue to rise. Look at the late payments, look at the number of, you know, you couldn't pick a date, but you could see it coming. A lot of people didn't want to recognize that. They thought that it, it wasn't going to happen to them. I can't tell you how many real estate investors I've watched that lived on credit during that time. Mm -hmm. They bought on pure speculation. Today, they're bankrupt. They've had multiple foreclosures. They'll never buy another piece of real estate again. And that, but they lived on credit. They bought on pure speculation in the market. We're going to see, you know, I see in my Seattle market, I see real estate prices. We're back into where people are bidding on properties. And that, so they're paying $100,000, $200,000 more for a piece of property. I don't say it, call it a recession. I think there's going to be a correction, you know, in the price in some of the markets. It's not across the United States. It's in select markets where we'll see. But that's normal course of business. But I always continue to watch, always maintain real close, the trends in servicing. Because that's going to tell you when we're going to start getting in trouble. I have a lot of friends who are into the single family homes and they are selling off the homes that they don't want to keep long term 
because they figure we're kind of at that top price on the single family homes. We're pretty comfortable with 2017 and 18. I think we're going to see a lot of things changing in the business industry and tax advantages to the business people, uh, infrastructure spending. So we're looking for at least two years of pretty strong economy. And after that, we'll renegotiate. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I'm the one asking the questions, not you. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I've been... And what's uh, your name again? What, <laughs> uh, I've had the... Uh, well, I've gained experience from going through two of these economic cycles uh, now. So uh, the first one in 99, and, uh, and I had a lot of uh, homes and uh, apartments. And uh, at that point, um, couldn't turn the ship fast enough when we go from a place where people, all of a sudden, the government comes out with a program where anybody can roll in all their debt and have no money into a house and therefore no reason to not walk away from a house. Anybody who could fog a mirror could get a home at that time. Well, I had you know, 400 apartments and 80 houses, and all of my folks were exiting and buying houses, and who could blame them? So it left me with a, a big cash uh, shortfall, and we had to wind, uh, wind our properties down just as uh, quickly as we could and sell them off in, in, in tranches. And um, we didn't do as well as we thought we were going to through that one. Um, so the second one here in uh, 2000, uh, that began in 2008, uh, we were in self-storage at the time, not um, all, all the way in, and we came out uh, of that one all right. So we didn't really make too many adjustments because, as I mentioned yesterday, self-storage actually does better during a recession. There's a higher demand for it, and there's less development. Um, self-storage does extremely well. Mobile homes do extremely well, as Kevin talked about. And um, so we did all right during that one. Uh, right now, my, um, I had a conversation the other day with the gal that, that does our PPMs, and she went to a large conference of SEC attorneys uh, they put together syndications, and um, she said what they're talking about right now is uh, saying that um, houses are drying up, apartments are drying up, um, people still are going out and finding mobile home parks and self-storage. You know, those are the two that are tops right now. And so she said, you are in a, in a great position to go raise capital for self-storage because of what we've seen. And, and, and she said, I raised my hand. I said, I, I know that the market is shifting already when the home folks stop calling me and Scott Meyer starts calling me on a weekly basis. So. Perhaps we, we are starting to see a little bit of the changes that Calvin alluded to, that we're starting to see some of the folks uh, in, in houses selling them off. Um, do you have to sell them off? You can wait a little bit longer. Just don't wait until the music stops, because that's what happened in 2008. Mm -hmm. And if, you're, if you built your business on nothing but credit, as uh, Steve said, you know, don't, don't get over leveraged. I think the, the, the bigger lesson to take away from this question, anything that anybody has said up here, is you know, what, uh, what happens during that time is your ability to sustain and your ability to grow, if it's built on nothing but credit, a lot of that credit will go away for a little while, or it'll be expensive, and that's going to cause a hiccup in your operation. And in some cases, it was a catastrophic hiccup that we've seen in the past. So um, I have no people idea. People became millionaires. What's that? And people became millionaires. And people became millionaires. And so also, as I mentioned yesterday, I was, you know, I was a victim of the first one. I, I did all right in the second one. And we plan to be participants in this next one. So the ability to position yourself to be sustainable and also to have the cash and, and the wherewithal or partners to go out and then buy up the properties from the folks who mm -hmm. didn't prepare, who right. didn't listen to the things that we're talking about here to prepare yourself, you'll be able to capitalize on that because there will be carnage once again, and that is when more people make money is off the carnage of others. That's right. And cash is always key. Cash is always yep. king. All right. And just to clarify something, I, I do like no money down deals. I love that. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have money. That you should still have reserves, and that's how you get through the storm. Good point. Real quick, Steve. So when, uh, when, when you're looking at a global underwriting of someone and you're, and you're doing a global spread, what, what type of leverage would you, what's the threshold that you would like to see across their portfolio that when alarms start going off? Well, you know, typically in that with a, you know, single family investor, if, they, if they're just buying a single family, you know, they're going to put 20%, you know, they're going to put 25% skin in the game. Um, they're going to have two to four units, they're going to do 25. Um, you know, the, the lending market continues to evolve. And in some cases, it's a little bit tougher for investors. Other cases, it's greater for investors. Um, you know, the misconception a lot with, the, you know, with a lot of lenders out there will always tell you that investment properties are always riskier. Um, I can tell you right now, uh, when you look at the servicing and that of those, the investors perform the best out of the servicing portfolio. They do. Less than a half a percent, typically straight across the board. But, you know, people need to prepare. You know, when I look at, when they talk about the recession, I look at that as an opportunity for real estate investors because you've got people that didn't prepare. They did not. They lived off credit. 
they thought that, you know, they, you know, pure speculation, they didn't look at cash flow. They're the ones that are, are you know, they're the ones that are going to fail. They've allowed themselves to fail. But I look at those times, you know, in those downturns sometimes, I look at it as an opportunity for investors. Because let's face it, the people lose their houses, they have to live somewhere. And so why not rent it back? And a lot of times in those cases, the investors would buy them and rent them back to the people that lost their house. Good, good. Well, the clock keeps going up. What do we got till noon? Is that right, Ben? Is that yeah. what we have? Is that, <laughs> just kidding. So one of the questions that I get very often is, um, okay, Scott, so where, where's, what's the best market? Where are you focusing right now? I, just whisper to my ear. I won't tell anybody. And, you know, so what, what are the best markets? And, and um, they know me for self storage, but what are the best asset classes? And I think a lot of you folks may have that question right now. So let, let's talk about the greatest opportunity to be able to put together whether it's just to plain get funding, to attract funding, to do things creatively. Is there a particular market in the U.S. to focus on? And the secondary to that is, you know, an asset class. You know, what, what is a great opportunity that, some, that we should be focusing on right now in this marketplace or even preparing for what may be coming? What, what's a good place to be focusing on right now? I'm doing a lot of good loans on apartments in the Atlanta area. And it's kind of scattered all over, but I have more focus in all in and around all of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So, so apartments in Atlanta. Okay, apartments. Steve, you know, I yeah, I work probably consistently in about 20, 20 different states, working with investors. A lot of opportunities in different markets. Um, I still find Memphis as far as being the number one market for single family because it offers a wide a wide range of values. So you can get people can get in with a relatively inexpensive price and have to get in to start that. They might move to other markets and have, but that's probably, I don't know, 35, 40% of my business right now still in Memphis. Um, I've owned properties in Memphis for seven years. I think it's worth the same now than when I bought it seven years ago. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think Chris is doing a great job with yeah. the different markets that he's in. So maybe that would be a good place to go is talk to someone like that. Look, I don't, I don't know. I don't even know how to answer that. Here's what I do know. If you start scattering your brain, you're not going to be successful. If you can focus in on something and get really good at that, mm -hmm. you're going to be rich. Mm -hmm. I guess that's really the best answer. Mm -hmm. I don't know what market. I mean, that's a tough question. Man, who put this guy in the panel? I mean, question <laughs> I have him. So Steve. I know. You know, and I have watched, and what, what I have seen is I've seen some other markets start to come back. You know, Indianapolis was a little slow for a while. You know, that's starting to come back. Kansas City was always kind of a sleeper, Kansas City, Missouri. Yes. Uh, you know, for years, you know, I didn't see, you know, I knew I was there. You know, I'd go back there and, and meet with the providers, and that, but it wasn't really big. Now you're starting to see more interest. Um, so you see it grow depending upon what you're looking for. And the opportunities, you know, you know, going back to Memphis, if you're looking for multi-units, you know, two to four units is probably not a place to go. And other markets, you know, other markets have better opportunities for that. Mm -hmm. I would be careful investing outside your own backyard unless you work with someone you really, really trust. Correct. Mm -hmm. I only worry about my money when Congress is in session. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. The best laid plan in the world, Congress will change the rules on you. Mm -hmm. And I'm old enough, they've done it several times to me. And it hurts. Mm -hmm. I mean, whatever you think you've got, it can change overnight. So true statement. True. Well, the SNL scandal in '89, yeah. I survived that. That was when the SNLs were lending 125 percent of the appraised value on any income-producing property. Yeah, I don't know how anybody can not think that that's uh, unsustainable, but um, we bought it. Yep. Well, for myself. Um, in the single family realm, yeah, backyard. I think you need to be backyard mm -hmm. 90 minutes away, and uh, especially when you're starting out, as you amass more and then you can have management in place, and that, that, that's the main thing is uh, you know, can you have management in place? Uh, when you get into commercial and you have property management companies that are uh, efficiently managing your facilities and your apartments for you, they understand the markets better, they understand the business, then we can start going out different places. And um, I will let the deal dictate where I invest. Um, Brokers, uh, my students, my partners will bring deals to us and then we will assess the deal. We will assess that market and then if we can effectively manage it third party, um, I, I don't have a lot of challenges uh, or indigestion about a property that's all the way across the country and, and that I don't visit very often. Uh, it doesn't mean that I won't go out and do my due diligence, but if I have a management company in place, they send me the financials and we take pictures of it and you know, we know what's going on. Uh, and again, 
you know, with self-storage, there's no broken pipes. We don't have, you know, tenant toilet issues or contractors to keep up on, so it's a little different animal. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, I think you need to get, stay close, keep an eye on it until you get to that realm where, where you have qualified people that can manage it and, and do that from afar. So that being said, um, we're going to wrap up with, yes? Yeah, absolutely. How about some questions from the audience? I wasn't sure if we were prepared for that. If we got some recommendations, they are now. They're jumping into action. So. Thank you. Uh, this question is more for Steve. Steve, you talked a little, a little bit about delinquency rates and taking a look at that to try to check where the market is going. Is there a specific rate or are you just looking for movement or what exactly are you looking for there? Well, basically what I do, and as is a lot of the companies I've worked for, Annette, they, uh, they service. Fannie and Freddie, Annette, when, you sell, when a, a big bank sells a loan to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they sell the loan. They don't sell the servicing. The bank services that for them. So the thing I want to do is I get with our servicing department probably on a monthly basis, quarterly, what, you know, whatever, and I try to see where the trends are at, you know, where things are going. And I'm always concerned about the stuff that I originate because I want to make sure, one, that I originate quality loans, um, and, you know, and I see that, you know, and I, and I really do see that. So, so servicing on my side, that's something that's really neglected by a lot of people in my industry. They don't look at that. They think once they've made the loan, they forget about it. Well, guess what? The way you continue in your business, and, that, and that's how I've gotten through the business, you know, the, the years that I've been doing this, because, well, I've been through some tough times in my years. But, you, you know, you look at those services, because right? that's where you're going to see where the problems are going to be. But it's typically not in the investment world. I mean, it was back in the mid-2000s. But now, any bank that tells you investment property, you know, lending is riskier, it's a, it's a fabrication. Because all they're looking at, they make more money when they do FHAs and USDAs, and that's why they push them. Next question. Not on. Oh, there. Okay. This is for Calvin. Uh, our, our family has ownership interests in independent living retirement communities, and we want to increase our network of lenders that do loans $10 million plus. Do you have any suggestions? I'm all over it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only guy in town. Uh, <laughs> let, let me say this. I can give you a letter comparing a bank loan to a HUD loan for the type properties you're talking about. And also, I have a market analysis for the assisted living that we're doing in Florida. If you want to look at that, if you're buying or doing anything in assisted living or buying apartments, the market analysis feasibility study is the most important product you will have, and it should be the first thing you go out and get. Mm -hmm. But just give me your card and put assisted living on it, and I'll email you some information on that. And that's for educational purposes only, of course. <laughs> but just to clarify, he said he's the only one in the world that does it, so. Mm -hmm. okay. Next question. Hi, uh, this is for uh, anyone that can answer it. I have a uh, client in California that has an eight, unit, an eight property portfolio around a college area, low LTV. They bought all the properties out of foreclosure back in 2008, so low basis. Um, they're having trouble refinancing out of that to step into the apartment world or into multiple units, you know, fourplex or, or greater. Um, and I'm wondering, one of the issues they're coming up with is that they're, they're losing the leverage on, on the real estate. So they have conventional loans on it now, but when they go to do a portfolio loan or something like that, usually, you know, the lender is coming back and saying, look, we want, you know, 60% or 70% or, or LTV. And I'm wondering if there are any other products out there that are available for someone like that who, you know, they cash flow really well, they're around a college area, they, you know, they're single family homes that rent for 4,500 and 5,000 a month. Um, and, uh, you know, basis is, you know, maybe 150,000 a door and they're probably valued somewhere at around five or 600,000 now. So they're trying to do a cash out refi, but they're, they're really struggling with, with getting anyone to, to do it. And how many homes do you have? Eight. We can talk. Yeah. I can do a scattered housing program that comes under HUD also. Okay. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Thank you. Uh, that sounds like an easy one. That sounds easy. Yeah. It's been tough in California for some reason. Well, let's talk. Wrong relationship. Yeah. Next question. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. 100% financing? 
Yes. Right. So I'm wondering if, you know, in, in Denver at least, I'm, I'm seeing 35-year amortizations. I'm seeing 100-plus percent financing. I'm wondering if that's a red or at least a yellow flag for um, you know, the market today and the potential of a correction coming, whether it's here or elsewhere in the country. I'm wondering, now I haven't been in the game long enough to have gone through a correction before, but is that uh, congruous with other corrections in the past? I, I don't think so. So my, my world's a little bit different. We don't have amortizing loans. So an amortizing loan is where you pay a, a set monthly payment over a certain period of time and, and then it pays off the loan, right? We're interest only, short term. So everything we're doing is for bridges. We're fixing and flipping, we're fixing and refinancing, or we're doing like wholesaling, that kind of thing. Um, anywhere we, you need a short bridge. Um, most of my loans pay off in nine months. And we're basing our loan on what the product or what the value of the house is after it's all fixed up. And that's really how, how the hard money works. You value it what it's worth after it's fixed up and we'll go to 70% of that. And I know we're running out of time, so I want to get this in, Steve. But So this book here that I wrote, um, it tells a little bit about my story, how I was buying properties with little or no money down, has all the forms, the scripts, some, some fun stories, my successes and failures. And I had those in my car, so I thought I'd give away five. So if anybody wants a book, oh, gosh. Oh, sh- <laughs> uh, I didn't quite expect it to go quite like that, but... You never had that response. First, like. first five hands that you see that can't be the front row. <laughs> so the book is The 45-Day in- Investor. I don't know, if did I answer that question well, Ben, or he's not even listening I think anymore. we covered it. Next question. I think we got time for one more. No, see, that's a difference with hard money also. We, uh, it's more like a construction type of loan, and I want to go out and touch the asset. So I have people here that work for me and in Minnesota. So those are the only two markets that I want to loan in, where, only where I'm comfortable. You know, I, I would, normally I would just say go to Bigger Pockets and go to their, their hard money lending directory. That's really the best directory that I've seen. Other questions? This one's for Steve. You mentioned you look at data from certain markets and you see some corrections coming in some markets. You gave Seattle as an example. Are there some off the top of your head that you see are coming up faster than others from a correction standpoint? You know, I, I think, you know, and where I'm at, like, in, you know, some of the Midwestern and Southern states, you don't see a lot of appreciation in those markets. I mean, you just don't see it. You know, people are going there for the cash flow. I'm starting to see, you know, where, where I'm starting to see some of those prices increase. Um, you know, obviously Seattle. Uh, Phoenix started, you know, the whole Arizona market probably started about two years ago. I mean, we watched the first quarter uh, back in, I think it was 14, increased 25%. It was almost overnight. And that continues to increase. So I've, I've seen, I've seen uh, less investors looking at, at that Arizona market because now they're priced out. Um, other markets, you know, Florida's starting to come on strong. You know, for a while there, and a lot of lenders didn't like Florida because that was like the number one fraud state Mm -hmm. uh, for mortgage lending. But now that's starting to come back strong. People are starting to look at. There's some great opportunities. The Carolinas, you know, North and South North and South Carolina, they got decimated when the hedge funds came in. A lot of the markets got hurt. Memphis got, you know, Memphis saw them come in real strong. Uh, The Carolinas, they they love the Carolinas. They just bought up everything. I watched turnkey providers just they couldn't compete. You know, they couldn't do it anymore. Now they're starting to come back. So you're starting to see that start to come back. In that. And it's kind of ironic because some of those, those uh, hedge funds that came in and bought the properties, guess where now the turnkey providers are getting their inventory. They're buying it directly back from the hedge funds. And that, some of them did really good. Other ones were copycats, tried to get on the wagon, and that didn't fail, you know, failed miserably, you know, didn't have the management support. But I see a lot of good markets. You know, I, I see a lot, you know, a lot of expansions. Some of the markets coming back. Again, the appreciation game, when people start talking to me, appreciation, here's a, it's a simple example. Let's say you buy a cake, okay, that's your cash flow. You put a cherry on top of the cake, that's appreciation. But you know, if you take the cherry on top, it still tastes good. And that's, that's the way people need to look at it. All right, gang, so with that, good information? Okay. So, next step is to grab these folks, network with them at lunch, 
Connect with them on the Whova app, and let's continue these relationships as we leave here. So with that, we'll turn it over to Ben and give everybody a round of applause again. Awesome. Thanks.